Okay. All right, great. I'm here to introduce our speaker this week, and I wanted to thank those that signed in online. And of course, we have a few of us here in the room. Um, for those of you that are online, please remain muted. Make sure you're muted for the duration of the talk, and then we'll have time afterwards, of course, to ask questions. So feel free to use the chat to put any questions uh, there as, as uh, we go along. So um, I am very happy to introduce our speaker this week. Um, I'm very excited to see more of her work. I've seen it before, which is why I reached out to our speaker, Dr. Julie West, who is an assistant professor in, the, in uh, North Carolina State University, uh, who got her PhD at UC Berkeley, which is obviously where our points of connection are, although she, she was a little ahead of me, she was already on her way. But her research includes ancient identities and topics such as the intersection of sex and gender and how the experience of daily life can leave distinct markers on the body. Uh, her expertise, as you can see, is in bioarchaeology. And she works in colonial era Mesoamerica. She has published, she's got a number of publications. I will mention a few that are, are notable, of course, International Journal of Osteoarchaeology, um, she was in the Rutledge Handbook of Mesoamerican Bioarchaeology, writing about the bioarchaeology of colonial New Spain, um, writing about ancient viral genomes uh, in e-life, uh, which is, is quite interesting. She's in Mesoamerican Archaeology Theory and Practice. She's got a chapter in there, Bioarchaeological bio Research on Daily Life in Emerging Colonial Society. Um, She's in, uh, oh boy, American Journal of Physical Anthropology, you know, all these peer reviewed um, journals, of course. She's in Exploring Sex and Gender. She co editor of a book, Exploring Sex and Gender in Bioarchaeology, with Sabrina Arkawal as well. So she's quite uh, busy and then very well published. And of course, she's got internal and external grants from Wintergren and UC Mexis. So she's very, very busy, and I'm, I'm quite impressed. So uh, please help me in welcoming Dr. Uh, Julie West. I, I want to give her time for her talk. So she does have a, a lengthy CV. I'm not going to read all of it, but just know she, she knows what she's talking about. So <laughs> uh, in any case, so uh, thank you very much. She's here to talk about bioarchaeological research on Africans and their descendants in colonial Mexico. And I will turn it over to Dr. West. Thank you. Great, thanks for that um, lovely introduction, Lisa. And yes, it's good to see we're both moving along uh, since our time at Berkeley. Um, as she mentioned, um, I'm gonna talk today a little bit about um, some research that I started mostly um, in my postdoctoral studies um, a number of years ago now, though um, we're still working on certain aspects um, of these projects and um, Really, it came out of research that I started doing um, uh, for my doctoral research, um, thinking about uh, colonial society. And um, as often is the case in historical archaeology, we tend to think about, particularly in Latin America, the impact that colonization had on the local indigenous population, how Europeans coming in to these places in Latin America changed. Um, their lives, um, and there's been less focus, particularly in Latin America, about the um, role that Africans and their descendants have played um, in colonial society specifically, and then also um, archaeological projects that are trying to um, really investigate these questions and how do we discern out this, um, what is often thought of or, or referred to as the third root of mestizaje, or that mixing of um, colonial society in Latin America. So I've been part of um, a research in initiative out of um, Harvard University and the um, Alari Institute, so the Institute of Afro-Latin American Studies, Afro-Latin American um, Studies, and so um, this is kind of part of what I've been working on um, in relationship to that project. Um, so as you can see in this um, beginning slide, um, Africans and their descendants have always been a part 
um, of colonial society. This is a detail of a, a much larger painting of the main market in Mexico City. Um, and you can see here um, the painter who painted this in uh, the 17th century clearly depicts right all of these different phenotypic differences of, of folks in this society. So these differences were known and um, documented, but we tend to overlook them or don't think about them as much. Um, and so I want to start off with first kind of a brief history um, of Africans and their descendants in colonial Mexico, since this is, again, a topic that um, in our research, but also kind of in the popular um, history and narrative of, of Mexican history has been er erased and omitted. Um, so it's not necessarily something that is as well known. Um, but Africans arrived uh, pretty much at the same time, or Euro Europeans arrived to uh, Mesoamerica, which was Mesoamerica at that time. Um, you can see here two different uh, codices that um, depict the arrival of Hernan Cortez in uh, 1519. Um, and there were uh, people of African descent in his um, group. Um, sometimes referred to as the Black Conquistador. Um, there's been quite a bit of research done on this individual in particular named Juan Garrido. Um, but uh, shortly after the arrival of Europeans, um, of course, there's a kind of decimation of the indigenous population due to uh, infectious disease, where they estimate um, nearly 20 million people uh, in New Spain or what is um, Mesoamerica. Uh, previously died from infectious disease in the first half of the 16th century alone. Uh, and so Europeans then turned to enslaved labor, um, um, enslaved African labor as a new source um, for their various projects. So you see, particularly in the 16th century and early 17th century, um, direct voyages from Africa to New Spain, bringing uh, enslaved Africans. Um, and in total, again, uh, the historical documents, it's always difficult to get the exact number, um, but roughly uh, about 250,000 enslaved Africans were brought to New Spain, which is um, certainly less than in other parts of Latin America, which I think also um, helps contribute to why there isn't as much research or talk about um, these folks in colonial society, um, but they came um, at three different kind of major ports. Um, and what's different about uh, New Spain in particular is two of those ports were part of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, so Veracruz and Campeche are in the Gulf of Mexico side um, of Mexico, but uh, Mexico in particular was the first kind of stopping point on the trans-Pacific um, slave trade route, uh, which started in uh, 1560s, got leaving from the eastern coast of Africa and Mozambique across to the western coast of the Indian subcontinent and then stopping in Manila in the Philippines before making their trans-Pacific um, journey across to Acapulco. So you see kind of a different part of the trade that, again, there's been less research done on this um, particular trade route, but um, it has kind of important implications for the folks who were enslaved in Mexico, um, as well as other parts of um, South America, particularly Peru. They would leave from Acapulco and go down to Peru oftentimes. Um, so overall, um, in colonial society at any given time, you know, starting from the mid 16th century, um, people of African descent were between 12 and 15% of the total population. Um, and if we look at kind of uh, population estimates for this time, that was almost four times as many Europeans that were in um, uh, Mexico City, for example, the capital of New Spain. So they did really have a significant um, play a significant role in colonial society, despite the fact that um, there hasn't been much uh, research on them. And in Mexico in particular, there's kind of been this um, active erasure from the narratives, uh, though there's been quite a bit of historical research and ethnographic research trying to kind of change that in the last um, 20 to 25 years or so. Um, and there's um, a few uh, archaeologists uh, trying to also bring to this um, discussion, how we can use archaeological research and bioarchaeological research to answer these questions. 
So what I'm going to talk about today is um, some work that I've done with uh, skeletal remains associated with the Hospital Real San Jose de los Naturales. Um, and this was a colonial hospital that uh, was first established in 1553 with um, financial support from the Spanish crown. Um, as is in the name, it was for los naturales or what was referred to as the local indigenous population. Um, so it was the first um, really hospital that focused on trying to provide care and support um, for the indigenous population, mostly again in response to these widespread infectious disease events. Um, and you can see on the map, um, if you've been to uh, Mexico City, the kind of main downtown square is um, B, which is here. Um, the Spanish uh, lived kind of in this gray area near that main square. Um, and originally this was an island, so the black outline indicates kind of the edge of the island. Um, but the hospital itself was located on the island and quite close to the main downtown area. So it was um, well situated. Um, it was at its peak, could see up to 200 patients at a time. So it was a quite large um, hospital. and. Um, what remained in service pretty much the entire colonial period until shortly after uh, Mexican independence in 1821, where they were struggling financially and eventually they um, closed down. Um, but when you look at kind of this history of hospitals in colonial Mexico, there were some, you know, specifically for the indigenous population, others were started for specific diseases um, like uh, hospital for syphilis and um, tuberculosis, uh, but there wasn't really an option for individuals who didn't fit nicely into the Spanish indigenous um, binary. And so what we end up seeing, of course, are um, people of African descent or people of mixed descent um, seeking care at um, this institution, which um, you can see on the right hand side, this is a, a picture from the meeting notes of the hospital um, from 1785. And um, it's quite interesting to read these uh, meeting notes. Um, you know, you think you go to meetings now and, you know, there's always a scribe taking notes, but a few hundred years later, it's interesting to see what they were talking about. Um, and in this particular case, they were um, chastising the administrator of the hospital for accepting patients who, um, in that last line, it says were um, mestizos, so mixed, mulatos, meaning mixed African, or any other um, quality that wasn't precisely Indian, um, which, of course, after 250 years of um, intermixing, is pretty uh, difficult to decide who is exactly precisely Indian at any time. Um, so, you know, kind of when I started to talk about doing this research with this collection, everyone's like, well, that was an indigenous hospital. Um, when in actuality, the hospital was uh, serving a much more diverse um, in, uh, population of urban inhabitants, um, including some people of um, African descent. So the um, hospital itself, again, um, stopped serving um, healthcare in the beginning of the 19th century. Um, in the beginning of the 20th century, the colonial building was raised and a modern building was um, constructed on the site. Um, however, in 1985, um, in the big uh, major earthquake in Mexico City, that modern building collapsed, um, which is pretty common in the historic downtown. The, um, it's not quite stable there again, because it used to be a lake. Uh, and so, uh, in the early 1990s, they uh, were doing salvage excavations to build a new tunnel for um, the green metro line, line 8. Um, and they knew that the hospital had been there, so they were expecting to find architectural features of the colonial hospital. Um, you can see in this image here um, some of the walls um, of their tech, uh, the hospital, again, two, three meters deep, but below it is the current um, surface. And um, instead, what they ended up finding um, were almost 600 individuals' um, uh, skeletal remains in a part where they weren't expecting to find them because um, the uh, cemetery of the hospital was in a different location. Um, so, of course, that uh, delayed things a bit, um, and they were able to work for a couple years to recover um, all of these remains. Um, as you can see in this bottom image, uh, a lot of them were in 
as kind of mass grave settings um, where they were uh, uh, combined together. Some of them were placed underneath architectural features um, and they date to this kind of very early period of the hospital um, and prior um, uh, craniometric and non-metric dental analysis suggests that approximately 5% um, of the, uh, the skeletal collection of those um, almost 600 individuals are of um, African descent. So when I was doing my original research, I was very interested in uh, biomechanics and labor, and labor organization, um, and a kind of whole separate talk. I could talk about the kind of sex gender aspect of labor. Um, and what I was really interested in doing was um, trying to analyze these data, not splitting my sample up by sex, and rather trying to find um, groups of individuals who are experiencing the same type of stress. Um, and so here you can see from um, one of my um, articles, that Lisa mentioned, I created these what I call cluster groups to identify individuals who are experiencing the same type of um, activities. And what ended up finding is um, rather than, you know, these groups being mutually exclusive by sex, instead there was a lot of variation among individuals of the same sex. For example, you can see here, um, two different males who were doing very different things um, and experiencing work in very different ways, um, kind of on the opposite um, ends of the graph. Um, and when I started to uh, dig in a little bit more and think about why are we seeing all these differences, um, thinking about the intersectional aspects of identity, um, sex or gender wasn't the most important thing in colonial society deciding deci that decided what your opportunities were for labor or even what your requirements for labor were. Um, and so in my post postdoctoral work, um, instead I shifted to asking these questions looking specifically at um, individuals of African descent, as you can see that one um, male on the kind of left uh, extreme of the graph um, was a young adult um, male of African descent. Um, and so if we look here, this is again um, cross-sectional geometry data. So this is looking at um, CT scans of 35% of the humerus, so the upper limb, um, trying to get at what different types of activities they're doing uh, in terms of their um, their daily lives. Um, the other interesting thing that ended up um, I ended up discovering looking just specifically at the Africans in this population is that that in and of itself wasn't a homogenous group, right? So um, you can't just look at males or just look at females or even just look at the Africans. You have to kind of look at all of those intersecting aspects of identity to understand how are they um, moving and what types of work are they doing. Um, so for example, um, individual 350, um, when we look at the cortical area or the total area, which you can see is the combination of the medullary area and the cortical area, um, is a much larger bone than, say, individual 296 here. Um, so the, it's taller there, shorter here. Um, but they have roughly the same percent um, cortical area, which uh, is important for bone strength, bone rigidity. Um, so they're um, both doing labor, but they're doing labor in different ways. Um, and the shape, which is, again, kind of what um, cross-sectional geometry is really interested in, is looking at um, where the axes of um, that uh, stress is received. Um, it's similar, more similar to each other, um, though the amount of stress that they're receiving is um, quite different. Um, and there's other individuals here who have less percent cortical area, um, less robust bones, um, but um, have, again, similar kind of axes or even different axes. So um, each of these individuals are kind of doing different things um, and trying to parse out who's doing what and um, why might even their experiences in the city be um, somewhat different. 
Um, so I also did um, enthesial change analysis, um, which I'm not going to talk too much about today, um, and uh, metacarpal radiogrammetry analysis, which was um, the other uh, article that Lisa mentioned was just recently published. Um, and here again, what was interesting about um, these data when I looked at the amount of cortical bone and um, bone maintenance and loss in the uh, kind of broader sample, um, you know, two things kind of appeared. First, that the um, hospital sample had higher cortical index scores um, than any of the uh, previous research that had been done with European archaeological populations, um, which you can see on the table here. Um, and we, you know, hypothesize in our article that this has uh, to do with, or what it might have to do with is um, specifically, the difference in diet between um, European populations and what the kind of typical Mesoamerican diet was, which, you know, stayed very similar um, in, in certain ways in the colonial period. Um, in particular, it's uh, much higher in calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus, um, partly due to the nixtamalization process of corn, where they soak corn in lime water, which is essentially calcium hydroxide. Um, Central Mexico specifically, they also supplement their diet with um, amaranth and chia seeds, um, both of which, if you go to Whole Foods, right, are marketed now as these superfoods um, because they're very high in um, a lot of these nutrients. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, there isn't really other comparative data for populations in the Americas to see whether or not, you know, these dietary differences hold true for um, archaeological populations. but. Um, the cortical index scores for the hospital were more similar to what you see in modern studies than the in Europe than the archaeological populations in Europe. Um, so then, what I also did was kind of pull out the um, African individuals. In this case, they're all male. Um, so three that were young adult males here, and two that were middle adult males. Um, and what's interesting there too is they also have um, almost all of them have a higher um, or equal to uh, cortical index scores than the indigenous population, and certainly all have higher than the um, European archaeological population. So, again, this is an incredibly small sample size of only five individuals, um, complicated by other factors um, going on in their lives, but it's kind of an interesting um, point to think about uh, looking in the future for gaining more um, comparative data for populations in Africa, both modern and um, archaeological to try and understand are these again um, dietary differences there you're having um, uh, higher peak values of uh, cortical bone um, are these related to uh, diet um, or are these more population level differences um, kind of things to to keep in mind um, so in trying to like parse out these uh, questions, I look to then, again, the historical record, which, uh, you know, luckily when you're doing historical bioarchaeology, you can ask some of these questions. Um, and when we look at, again, oftentimes um, historical records will um, provide some information, but not always um, the best information uh, in terms of um, not specifically focused on Africans in, in their lives and their daily lives. Um, but there's also a lot of visual representations um, and kind of the typical uh, labor that we see for uh, enslaved folks in uh, Mexico City during this time. Um, one of the major things that they did was work as domestic servants. Um, and this was for both males and females of African descent. Um, so you can see here again a detail of a painting, which is in the um, National Art Museum. Um, and then um, there's been a lot of research done looking at Costa paintings. So these um, are looking at the mixing of different folk, um, people of different uh, origins. Um, but when you actually look at the details of these Costa paintings, they actually tell you a lot about um, these people's daily lives. Um, and so the one in the middle in particular, um, uh, he's dressed as a coachman or a cochero. 
Uh, and this was, again, a very typical job that uh, men of African descent would do. Um, uh, thinking about um, what that job entailed, it's very uh, visible. Um, they're able to move around the city. Um, as we saw in the first slide, he was also dressed as a coachman. He um, would go to the market, purchase items um, for their owners or possibly themselves. Um, and so we have to think too about how that um, impacts the visibility and the role that they played um, in colonial society. And um, looking kind of later, um, there's some census information also on um, free blacks in the city and what type of work that they did. Um, so many would um, work in skilled trades, like you can see in the third image here, this is a cobbler. Um, again, from one of the Costa paintings, um, there's also skilled labor in the textile workshops in and around the city. Um, and um, oftentimes they would also work in bakeries um, as well as kind of other more manual labor, uh, usually for construction projects. Um, but during this time period in particular, they were really focused on um, creating more usable land. So a lot of this um, went into kind of a large um, drainage pro uh, uh, project for the uh, Valley of Mexico. So it's no longer a lake when you visit Mexico City and they drained out um, kind of all of this. So it was kind of backbreaking work underwater, oftentimes kind of fixing, um, fixing things and uh, both free and enslaved folks would um, do this type of work. So I should note, you know, because the collection was buried in association with the hospital, uh, we really don't know if any of these individuals were uh, free or enslaved. Um, and so I started a collaborative project with two uh, Mexican colleagues, they're um, paleogeneticists, um, and we were interested in trying to understand um, what the ethnogeographic origin um, was of these individuals and also kind of the range of biological diversity um, that we see in the folks who were brought to uh, New Spain during the colonial period. Um, so we uh, conducted ancient DNA analysis um, for uh, 21 individuals, um, again, based off of those prior uh, bioarchaeological analyses, um, and as I'm sure many of you know, our methods for assessing ancestry are not perfect. Um, and so four uh, turned out to not be of um, African descent. Um, but we have uh, mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA um, for these individuals. Um, and then we also um, processed uh, strontium isotope analysis to uh, get a better sense of their place of origin. So were they born um, in the Americas or were they born in um, Africa? So again, the historical research on the um, slave trade is uh, primarily focused on the trade itself. Um, so uh, there's a great website called Slave Voyages um, that is working to digitize a lot of the uh, ship manifests and process this information. Um, and when you do a search for voyages specifically coming to New Spain, so one of the um, ports that I mentioned earlier, um, you can see that a significant amount of those uh, voyages occur um, in the uh, 16th and early 17th century. Um, and then there is a pretty steep drop off um, after 1640 uh, when the asiento or the monopoly trading contract that the Portuguese held um, collapsed. So there's much uh, fewer voyages coming to New Spain. Usually these would be individuals applying for specific contracts rather than a monopoly contract. Um, and so a lot of, again, the influx of um, individuals directly coming from Africa occur in the early um, colonial period. Um, but again, the historical information that we have um, focuses mostly on um, uh, embarkation and debarkation points, um, the principal region of slave purchase, which you can see here. Um, again, these are specifically for the voyages that went to New Spain. Um, and what's interesting about this is um, kind of more broadly when you look at the transatlantic slave trade, um, you can see many purchases occurring in the earlier period here in West Africa, and then it kind of shifts down the coast um, into what is uh, West Central Africa. But here, um, West Central Africa is actually the um, 
largest uh, region of slave purchase for um, New Spain, and that includes, um, again, that's the earlier period um, before really you see a lot of those other voyages leaving from um, West Central Africa. So we, you know, kind of see there's a, a variety of um, individuals coming from different places within the African continent, um, but that's only kind of in the early period of um, up until 1640. And um, for New Spain in particular, um, the history is complicated by the fact that we also have, um, after that point, a significant increase in the number of inter-American voyages. Um, so these are voyages that leave from a different port in the Americas. Um, typically, those that are coming to New Spain left from Jamaica or from Cartagena and what is today Colombia. Um, and uh, these are further complicated by the fact that there was a significant amount of illicit trade going on um, between these ports as well. So obviously we don't have ship manifests um, for these um, illicit voyages. And when we start to think about kind of what are the original origins in the African continent of these folks, um, we might know, you know, they're coming from Jamaica, they're coming from Cartagena, but we don't necessarily know um, where they came from before they came to the Americas or if they were born um, in those locations. Um, so again, the historical records can provide us some information and it's certainly interesting to go through and there's been a number of historians who have done that. Um, but what we are hoping to do with our um, ancient DNA project is to add some more data and information in terms of what is this diversity of individuals who are coming to um, New Spain. So first I want to talk a little bit about the um, strontium analysis. Uh, and here you can see for um, uh, the individuals that we sampled, the blue is for um, tooth samples. Uh, so again, this would represent the uh, time period when the tooth was developing. We primarily selected molars and premolars. So this would be kind of their early to mid childhood time. Um, and then um, for most of them, we also were able to take a bone sample. So um, looking at the bone sample would then represent kind of the last um, six to 10 years of their life. Um, and where they were living. And obviously we know that they were buried in Mexico City. Um, so the yellow line uh, represents the average uh, strontium for the basin of Mexico. Um, and uh, you can see here that for um, a number of the individuals, it appears that they were actually um, born in the African continent. They have very high uh, tooth values. Um, so the range for Africa is um, much higher, uh, anywhere between um, 0 0.71 to 0 0.73, uh, depending on kind of what region of um, Africa that they're coming from. This is generally because the, um, the soil in Africa is much older from these older geological processes. Um, but then there's a few individuals that I also want to, you know, kind of point out here. So um, three of the individuals in the green boxes um, appear to be not local to the basin of Mexico. So their tooth values are higher than the average that we would expect um, for uh, Mexico specifically. Um, they're also slightly higher for some of them than kind of the broad range uh, strontium values you would see for other parts of uh, Mesoamerica, but um, consistent with uh, other locations in the Americas. So could they be possibly, um, again, folks that were born in maybe the Caribbean and were labor later brought to Mexico City on one of these inter-American voyages? Um, one of the isolated crania that we sampled, um, individual 177, um, is kind of our best guess for someone who might be actually local to the basin of Mexico. Um, uh, but again, uh, you know, kind of what those averages are, uh, they're similar to other parts of, of Mesoamerica. So it could, it could also be someone that is 
um, born in the Americas, but not necessarily in the basin of Mexico. Um, and then the other thing that I want to point out is there's um, two of the individuals that we sampled are um, adolescents. Um, one that is probably in their early teens, 284, and um, one that's kind of older in their older teens, so 417. Um, and the data from these individuals suggests that they were likely born in the African continent. Um, and their bone sample, again, representing, you know, the last few years of their life is significantly less. So um, they were um, transported um, at a very early age. And this is another kind of uh, part of the um, slave trade and uh, discussion that we don't tend to talk as much about as um, uh, those who are brought over as children. Um, and so we were really interested to see kind of where um, these individuals are from and, and, and kind of talk about that um, part of the trade uh, as well. So when we have this idea of, you know, kind of um, who, many of them may actually have been born um, in Africa, then we were trying to then also understand what part of the African continent they're coming from. Um, and so we looked at the um, mitochondrial DNA, uh, which uh, comes down the maternal line. So this uh, um, would be passed from mother to both daughter and sons. Um, and the haplogroup frequencies you can see from this map um, aren't mutually exclusive to different regions. Um, but there are certain regions where um, certain haplogroups tend to be higher in frequency. Um, and so you can see here that we had um, a pretty broad range of um, mitochondrial haplogroups. So they're not all, you know, kind of coming from the same um, population. Um, and um, again, uh, it's kind of split between uh, West Central Africa and um, West Africa. Um, there's also three that um, are more common in Central Africa, which is, again, something that we tend not to think about as much because the historical documents talk about the coasts, the ports on the coast, um, but that isn't necessarily where those people are from. Um, and so it's what we were trying to get at um, looking at this mitochondrial DNA. Um, but again, this isn't, you know, telling us specifically um, what country or what region um, they might be from. Uh, so we also looked at um, whole genome uh, nuclear DNA. Um, and here you can see a PCA plot of um, our reference sample. I know they're very small um, uh, names there. So I tried to give you kind of these broader uh, regions in the circles. Um, and uh, you can see the three, uh, three of the individuals that did not appear to be African included here. Um, they don't um, uh, cluster with any of the African populations. Um, and then we had, again, um, a, a number of, of folks coming from the Senegambia region. So this would be West Africa. Um, and then others coming from um, parts of um, West Central Africa, so um, farther down um, what was Area 5, right? Cameroon, Angola, and Gabon, um, kind of looking at these um, diversity of individuals. Uh, and then interestingly, we had um, two individuals that were um, on this plot um, pairing with um, folks that were more representative of East Africa. So again, thinking about the differences between the transatlantic and the trans-Pacific trade, um, could these possibly have been individuals who um, were coming from, you know, the eastern side of Africa and then going through um, the Pacific route um, and eventually coming to New Spain um, through Acapulco. Um, we also did some radiocarbon uh, dating for these individuals. Um, and they do appear to correlate with this earlier period. So again, when um, most of those early um, routes were coming prior to uh, 1640. Um, so again, thinking about that difference in region that we, we tend to think of uh, West Central Africa become coming more so towards the end of the 17th and the 18th century, um, but that appears not to be the case um, for these individuals uh, in Mexico specifically. 
Um, and obviously there's, there's a whole lot more I can say um, about the data, and, but there's always been two kind of individuals um, that really stood out to me and I've thought, I, it always kind of like sticks in the back of my mind, what was going on with these um, two individuals in particular. Um, one of them was um, individual 150, he was a young adult um, and uh, he kind of stood out for a number of regions of reasons, um, one of which was that he had culturally modified teeth using uh, a percussion method, which is more typical of um, the uh, dental modification practices of African societies than what we saw in um, Mesoamerica, which was more of a filing method. Um, and uh, looking at other data for the Americas, um, this seems to correlate with um, other evidence. Uh, again, he, uh, his strontium data suggested he was likely born in Africa. Um, and so other in other places in the Caribbean and South America where we see these same types of dental modification practices, they also um, appear to have been born in Africa and were later brought to the Americas. Um, so this is, again, a practice that doesn't appear to continue um, in subsequent generations. Um, what was also interesting about this individual um, is at the moment of recovery, um, he was found with um, three different um, buckshot pellets um, and two needles. And so again, thinking about this being the context of a hospital, um, you know, someone must have brought him to the hospital to try to receive care, try to um, uh, save this individual's life. And um, it, it didn't work, obviously, um, but I always wondered, you know, what happened to this man? Was the gunshot intentional, accidental? Um, during this time period, particularly the early 17th century, there was a lot of tension about possible uprisings and rebellions, um, including a number of public executions of, of individuals of African descent in the city um, and a, a pretty famous um, rebellion by um, a man named Yanga, who uh, established a, um, uh, a runaway community, a maroon community. Um, and so, you know, kind of what was the relationship, you know, what was it like to move about the city um, in a way that um, very clearly distinguished yourself as an other, right? Having these um, modified teeth and how did that affect um, your experience? Um, a second person was um, individual 350. He's also a young adult male, um, but this was one of the individuals that um, appeared to possibly have been born in the Americas, though maybe not local to central Mexico. Um, he was consistently an outlier on all of my studies of biomechanical stress. Um, very tall, very robust man, doing lots of hard manual labor. Um, and um, kind of most interesting in terms of the, his context in C2, as you can see from this image and from the prior images, even though a lot of the individuals were buried in these kind of mass grave contexts, um, they were all mostly buried in you know, an extended position on their back, which is um, typical of Christian burial practices. Um, but this individual um, was not. Um, it, he's, he's on his stomach down, appears as though his lower limbs have kind of um, flipped around, um, almost as if he was thrown into the pit rather than carefully placed there. Um, and again, kind of these questions of why was he not given the same respect and burial um, as most of the other, um, pretty much all of the other individuals um, of African descent um, and kind of what, what was his relationship? Why was he at the hospital? Um, these are all kind of questions that I wish I had answers to um, that are hard to, to figure out. Um, so I kind of want to just end with one uh, uh, extra bit that we're doing with the DNA research is um, uh, admixture analysis. Um, and this is, uh, again, with my um, colleague, Dr. Avila, she's done um, quite a bit of research with modern DNA from Afro-Mexican communities, which you can see on the bottom here, um, primarily from um, the Costa Chica and Oaxaca and um, individuals from Veracruz. And then um, on the top, you see the different reference samples that we have um, throughout different parts of Africa. 
Um, and of course, uh, you know, the, the kind of caveat is always um, what we're comparing to is, you know, is your best reference sample. And um, as you can see here, each of these is an individual. And um, in the part where we're seeing most of the people coming West Central Africa, we have very small reference samples. Um, so, you know, there's also a need and an effort to try and um, think about these data in, in that context as well. Um, but we can see here there's kind of a variety of admixture between both the um, archaeological populations um, with the ancient DNA and the um, modern populations where there's a distinct difference between those in um, the Costa Chica and those in uh, Veracruz, which is also kind of an interesting point that we've we're, we're still talking about this as we write up the, the manuscript that, you know, Veracruz was a port city, so they have people continually coming in um, throughout the colonial period, whereas uh, in the Costa Chica, which is on the Pacific side, um, a little bit lower than Acapulco, you, you might not have as much of that influx. Um, and then, of course, in central Mexico, um, there are slave markets there, but also, you know, there, there's a different range of, of variety going on um, in these different um, places. Um, and how can we think about these historical data and these modern data and connect it into what's going on in the country right now? Um, so just uh, in the past um, seven years has the government um, begun to add a question on the census about um, auto identification as um, being an Afro Mexican or a person of African descent. Um, again, you can see on the coasts where um, Acapulco is in Guerrero and um, uh, Port of Veracruz and then Campeche is here, um, you see higher percentages of people still living in those places um, auto identifying as Afro Mexican. Although, again, since it's an auto identification question, it's probably um, likely an undercount in terms of the actual kind of uh, mixing of Air African heritage throughout the um, country today. Um, but, you know, adding to this uh, research and these discussions are important to. You know, kind of help highlight and um, uh, the important contributions of people of African descent, particularly because of the erasure that has happened um, throughout you know, um, the history of, of, of national Mexican national identity, um, and also to combat the prejudice and discrimination that a lot of these um, individuals of African descent continue to experience um, today. So um, I want to. Uh, just say thank you to a lot of people um, so we have some time for questions um, and also finish with um, if you're interested in learning more about this there's a great um, a freely available book by um, some of my colleagues it's in Spanish um, but uh, it talks a lot about this um, erasure and um, the kind of modern communities and how um, we can um, bring more to the forefront these discussions of, of African descendants in Mexico. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. West. Um, I know you're getting some, some virtual emoji clapping and some okay. physical clapping, <laughs> so I, I hope you're feeling the love. Um, I have, I do have one question in chat. I have my own question, but I'm gonna first start with um, Dr. Jenny Burns here. Um, I thought bone could not be used for uh, strontium isotope sampling due to diagenesis. I this think it's a methodological question, so I'm going to let you. <laughs> yes, and to a certain point, I, I know um, a lot of the, that research was done by our colleagues in the Institute of um, Geophysics at um, UNAM. Um, so they did do some um, specific processing to test um, the diagenesis uh, and certain individuals we did not test because of that. Um, but it, you know, the ones that we did process, the ones that they um, did the test for appeared to be um, well enough preserved that um, they were able to get uh, data from the bone. Um, also, as you can see from some of the images overall, the collection is very well preserved. Um, the ancient DNA uh, that we were able to recover it was all, the endogenous DNA was also quite high um, because of that, uh, and this really has to do with the fact that um, Mexico City used to be a lake, 
um, and so the water table is very high um, and overall preservation tends to be quite good um, for, for skeletal remains in the city. But thank you for the question. Uh, you got a thumbs up there, so <laughs> that's good. Um, I had a question because I think the actual colonial research you're doing is is, is pretty interesting too. You, you talked a little bit about the actual written documentation and how there was a comment in the meeting notes that there was a little bit of upset as to why even accept Africans into this um, hospital. Do you know? If there were hospitals specifically for indigenous peoples and, and then hospitals specifically for Europeans, they were not hospitals for Africans or African descent. They petitioned for one in the 16th century um, to the um, to the Viceroy, uh, but they were not, it was not accepted. They did not create one. Um, so I, I don't remember the specific logic of it. I think it had to do with finances likely. Um, but yes, they did they did petition for it because, you know, as you know, in colonial society where there was the Republica de Españoles and the Republica de Indios. And if you're not any one of those two things, European or indigenous, um, you didn't really have the same institutions available to you and you had to get creative in certain ways and how you went about um, finding the resources. Um, and, you know, the other thing that I think is most interesting about um, the historical research, which is, uh, is always great when you have historical uh, documents to work with is, um, you know, we're dealing with data and, and biology, um, but your identity, your calidad, as they called it, was um, often reputational and not based on biology. So it had to do with what job you did, what language you spoke, what clothes you wore, um, and you could kind of navigate in a way we would call passing now, right, um, in these different these different locations. So if you spoke an indigenous language, you could, you know, kind of um, navigate the, those spaces in a different way. Um, and, and same if you spoke Spanish, right, if you were culturally um, or acculturated into Spanish, you could um, buy things in the market easier, you could move about the city a little bit easier, and there certainly are cases of individuals being able to um, purchase their own manumission um, because of that. So if they represented really, what you say, 12 to 15 percent of the population, does that mean that either they were not getting medical treatment at all or that they had to kind of slip into those indigenous hospitals with the hope that they would be seen? That's kind of the idea. I mean, the other thing to keep in mind is that um, it was it, the purchase price was quite high, um, particularly in the early colonial period. And so um, having uh, being able to purchase an enslaved person was a kind of sign of status. Um, and especially if they were a domestic worker or they worked for you in a visible capacity in the city, um, there was certainly an investment. Um, by the usually the Europeans who are making these purchases to um, keep them healthy and provide health care and things like that. So um, it's unclear, you know, how much, you know, they would need to do to find these um, opportunities or if there would be other um, if, you know, the, the owner would um, also enable um, health care if needed. Uh, all right. Well, I don't want to be the only one uh, asking questions. If there is anyone that has a question, I don't want to take your time. Is there anybody else uh, out there online that has a hand up or has a question that maybe did not put it in the chat? I have a question. If uh, yeah, Dr. Hart, can you hear me? Yes, can I can. Mm -hmm. yeah, my question is: You were talking about the uh, teeth modification and yes. contrasting African versus you know Mexican practices. Could you talk about that? I think you said percussion teeth modification. I'm trying to envision that reactive to that too. Or <laughs> <laughs> and I never knew about that. Could you kind of elaborate and talk about that a little bit? Sure, yeah. Um, and certainly this is an area of research that still needs a lot of work. There's a few folks working in, in Mesoamerica to really try and create 
you know, understandings in different regions of what the practices were. Um, oftentimes it's, you know, and we had someone with modified teeth and this is what they looked like. Um, but it, there isn't necessarily a connection to how, um, what, you know, what was the role in terms of identity. Um, and so it's similar in, in different parts of, of studies in Africa, but um, we know that um, which teeth were modified and in which ways. So the, the ones you saw were kind of filed or well, percussed into this kind of triangle. Um, that happened in, in different places in West Central Africa, like um, the Congo, um, but also in other parts of um, West Africa. So what we usually call the Gold Coast uh, in, in Ghana and, and um, Ivory Coast area. Um, so again, kind of, can we use just that modification to say what part of Africa they're from? Not necessarily, um, but the way that they would go about modifying the teeth um, was different. So um, percussion would be more similar to like what we would think of of, of flint napping. Um, so it would be, you know, someone pushing very hard on the teeth and chipping a bit off. Um, there was another individual where um, they percussed first and then filed. Um, so it could be a, a multi-step process, whereas um, in Mesoamerica, um, they, you don't see that kind of pointed um, version uh, usually, and, and usually it was a, a mostly a filing process that they would do. Um, um, you also see incised teeth, so they would place little bits of jade or obsidian on the front of the teeth uh, as well. So um, the method of going about these modifications were, were distinct enough that they, that was what originally they were like, oh, we know there's people of African descent because they have these different um, types of cultural modifications. Um, and then that combined with some of the craniometric and non-metric dental analysis, and now plus with the DNA, we know that there, there definitely are people of African descent in this collection. Yeah, I had not heard of the percussive method. I've only ever really thought about filing. I thought that was pretty interesting too. We have five minutes left. My, my only other question, and I don't see a hand up, so I don't think I'm cutting anybody off. Um, and, and maybe you don't have this information. You had it on the one individual. If okay. there is any um, either information on the bones themselves or in the colonial records as to the kinds of things they were going to the hospital for, like why, it, it, was it evident the thing that led to their death? Were you able to see kind of violence or disease or whatever? Yeah, certainly there are some um, individuals. There's an uh, one of the African individuals has um, broken leg, um, pretty clearly um, misaligned, not uh, set, um, somewhat healed. Um, so again, you know, was he taken to the hospital in an attempt to heal the broken leg, and then it didn't heal, and ultimately um, he passed away. Um, other kind of in the broader collection, um, there is evidence of, um, of, of syphilis, there's evidence of uh, tuberculosis and some other um, kind of more long term uh, paleopathologies. Um, but the individuals that I was looking at specifically for um, the biomechanical research, I, I, I chose folks who didn't have those kind of typical paleopathological changes. Um, you know, thinking through the osteological paradox that um, likely they passed away before um, their bone chemistry would actually change or the shape would change and I could get at this kind of idea of what was their daily life experience um, without that complicating factor of, of also having some kind of an illness. Um, and the historical records do, you know, do show that many folks from smallpox and yellow fever and some of the other infectious diseases um, did pass away quite quickly um, in terms of, um, you know, within a week or a month. Um, and, uh, and the kind of burial context suggests that a lot of them were buried, uh, a lot of people were buried at the same time in kind of the same context, also suggesting that they, they likely were um, victims of a, of a disease epidemic. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions for Dr. West? Okay. Well, thank you again so much for, for um, 
coming and sharing your research with us. Uh, it's incredibly interesting. Thank you for, actually, it's, it, I will also say it's great timing because I, I'm, I'm talking about Colonial Mixed Code this week. So, uh, <laughs> there, and I'm going to refer my students to that. So, thank you so much. Have a good rest of your day, everyone that signed on. And thank you again, Dr. West, for, for spending an hour with us and sharing uh, your research. So, thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs>